Well, so I actually, I do mm. want to ask you about the title, mm. The Shape of the Sky, mm. but um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the space that we're in, mm. how you've thought about this particular presentation mm. as, you know, the, the premise that it's one work, mm. but obviously there's many different things. There's the sort of strings or the lines that are connecting fairly disparate mm. things, concepts, time periods. So maybe mm. start there with Definitely. This yeah, so place. the concept of one work for me is about one, maybe one, by pulling one part in a net, it looks like one string, but when you pull it, all of the other parts of the net sort of move in sync with that one thing. Um, so a lot of the stories here are connected between places that have become somewhat separated through time, but uh, they have deeper similarities or deeper roots which are interconnected. Um, so for example, this building, industrial building in Singapore, um, also my studio, which is an industrial building, has a lot of containers, a lot of things coming and going out of the building. Um, so one of the departure points for this is the pathway of one container in and out of a, let's say, contemporary commerce, commercial um, situation. And that leads into different historical, different, um, more complex interrelationships between places in and out of Singapore Harbor. Um, but yeah, the starting point is one of interconnection between places. So um, there's a, a kind of, I guess it's a, a fable or maybe a myth uh, that everywhere a ship has traveled, there's an invisible string that follows it. And so if all those strings still existed today in visual or in a creative format, this is one sort of situation for how that might look. Let's talk a little bit about direction mm. then, because I think that's where mm. you know, this weaving, whether it's conceptual or you know, potentially mm. physical, comes in from mm. these different directions or trajectories, mm. and then also very physically manifested mm. at the center of the, the ceiling of this presentation. Yeah, so orientation is very important. It's something that's in our bodies, in our ancestors, in our kind of liquidity. Um, and so when people come into the space, the first thing we do is there's a compass in the center and the direction of the communities that are involved in this exhibition on the ceiling. So looking up to the sky brings one into contact with all of the communities and other people that are a part of this exhibition. And then looking down into the compass helps each of us to look in the direction that we came from or look a bit more into our own roots. Um, so this is something that we've sort of unlearned in our education nowadays is how to become more disoriented from cardinal directions, from wind, from sea tides, from bird pathways. Um, but it's something that we all have inside of our bodies, our memories. So if you look back into that directionality inside one's own existence, like there's a kind of a way of reorienting to the pathway of, of birds or the pathway of wind, for example. Whereas we've become much more familiar with square spaces and cement, rectilinear um, constructed environments. Those are also, we're capable of orienting even within the structures and the linear um, systems that we're, we're brought up into. Um, so this is, I mean, it's intentionally kind of chaotic and dispersed and incomplete. Mm -hmm. So the strings, many of them uh, are connected for reasons and other ones, the reasons are not yet apparent and then some connecting to emptiness. And so this is kind of happening in the present moment. Um, some of the events from the 1800s are documented here, but impartially and kind of more connected to an oral way of telling those histories rather than a textual or 
a kind of colonial way of looking at the past. It's based on rumors and things people have told me or things someone told someone else that got passed on from one person to the next. And then here they're recirculating. Um, gives a new sense of orientation. So maybe can you talk a little bit about the specific mm. communities and places that you're calling out mm. as part of this yeah. presentation? So the yarn that we're holding right now was made by the craft studio La Mano in Machidashi, which is part of Kanagawa Prefecture, near Yokohama City. And it's uh, founded by Kenji Takano. And it's a facility where people uh, make things with their hands every day. So they commute to this facility and dye with, for example, indigo um, or other natural dyes, um, weaving, textiles, um, very much la mano, the hand. Um, but they are people that have been uh, diagnosed with different forms of abilities or disabilities. So they're not able to um, work in, in all of the same um, environment that some people would, but they make wages, they come and work there, and then they go home at the end of the day. Um, it's a beautiful facility, it has a really warm spirit, and I got to know them in four or five years ago. Um, so they've contributed all of the yarn here, uh, made by hand. Um, and they're oriented this direction, so right near the entrance to the comma space. Um, the next community is in Tanjung Kupang or Johor, right across the uh, Tuas Bridge. And that's a nature club um, founded by Shalan and uh, Serena, where they document uh, heritage, ecological history, and contemporary marketplace for fish and other things that they're selling to benefit the community. So it's very much about empowerment, about preservation, but not just static preservation, also living active history. So even as the sea changes, as the development in incurs on the villages and they're documenting, you know, everything from train pathways to boat pathways to mangrove species. Um, and I've been collaborating with them over the last two years. So drawings and photographs that are in the space here are some things that have spiraled out of that conversation. Uh, with them. Um, so we also had a workshop the opening weekend together with three members of Kela Balami teaching us some cuisine and cooking different things um, that were shared by King Kalukawa and Sultan Abu Bakar in 1881 when they met um, during his round the world tour. So cooking was a way of reconnecting with the borders closed right now. It's harder and harder to eat in groups and so this online workshop and their cooking instruction video is a way of using ginger and chili and other spices in your own kitchen to revisit this form of intercultural engagement between Malaysia and Hawaii, which is in this direction. So the Hawaiian islands um, are important to my life and awakening and um, just consciousness of indigenous roots and how to pay attention to those in the present moment. Um, so stories also, for example, coming out of centers of power about smaller islands and the, the damage that those, those stories can have when they're told um, without including people's uh, micro histories is something I learned in very, very closely in Hawaii. So Hawaii is in this direction, and there's images, including stills from the film Aloha Aina um, by Matt Yamashita, as well as the concept of shape of the sky comes from Sam Lowe, uh, navigator. So uh, celestial navigation and ways of understanding space um, through different forms of, of knowledge. Uh, comes from Hawaii in this direction. And so the, I mean, what's called the Second Hawaiian Renaissance in the 1970s inspired a lot of other uh, peoples, islanders, indigenous people all over the world to recognize their own language, culture, um, and cherish those traditions. And then the last community or orientation is toward Pandan Mukin, the Pandan River where it meets the sea, uh, now known as West Coast. 
um, but that area is considered to be quite auspicious where the sea water and the fresh water meet. Um, so that's right in front of my studio right now and that's where I notice the tides, I notice the, the wind patterns, I notice um, container ships and smaller vessels come and go. Um, so in this direction is where many of these artworks and conversations occurred uh, in my practice right now here in Singapore. So those four communities are very directly represented here with the tide charts, the maps, the drawings, the shipping records which are delivered to my studio, um, the bindings, all of those four communities are directly uh, included and then there's also many others who I haven't mentioned but unnamed amazing people that have also contributed stories, ideas, materials generously to my practice to make this possible. So tell me about the shape of the sky and how you chose it for the title and how it fits in with these mm. other things that have a certain shape. We have the mm. shape of the coastline, we have mm. the shape of the tides. Mm. Um, yeah, the sea, the sky, and the land are interconnected parts. Um, so they each depend on each other and we tend to live our day-to-day -day life in contact with land and sometimes sea. I've always, most of my I'm, different places that I've lived have always been near the sea. Um, and the sky is kind of expansive and always there, but also can be a bit far away, you know, in, for example, urban areas where there's lots of light pollution, the sky can always be there, but yet be invisible. Um, in, you know, mythological senses, you know, the sky has a really strong presence or a strong energy that it feeds to us, but um, just to those, I mean, you have to listen, you have to look up, you have to want to kind of seek its energy. I guess the moon also pours down its energy and controls our tides, our you know, cycles of the body, of people's movements. Um, so the sky, I guess, kind of exerts a lot of um, influence over us without, whether we realize it or not, is, is kind of what the shaping is about. So um, Sam Lowe, a Polynesian navigator and um, on the uh, PV, Polynesian Voyages Society inaugural mission, uh, wrote a book about these memories of the sky and about um, navigating according to um, all of the incredible encyclopedia of information that comes up each evening. Um, so the, I mean, the stars is one literal way of shaping or understanding the shape of the sky. But I also think of it here as a metaphor for how we all can reconnect with something that's always there, um, but we might need help from other people. So it's something that we can't always discover on our own or we haven't been educated about how to read the sky. It's something we need support or models or language of how to read these different points or and turn them into constellations or how we need to kind of see the connections between what's already there and make sense of it in our own lives. Um, so the shape of the sky is about how we form in the present day um, constellations or connections between things that might seem like separate points in the sky and they might exist in different time periods but they're all through the, the kind of shaping or the navigation of the relationship between these stars, we find uh, many forms of interconnected, abundant histories that are still alive today. So that's kind of the shape of the sky and what it means nowadays is to draw upon ancestors to understand what's important nowadays. Yeah. Well, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about kind of maybe taking a step back. Mm. <clears throat> maybe taking a step back, the concept of social practice mm. and, you know, how that came to be 
mm. which certainly has, you know, there are physical objects, there are images that mm. we're looking at, but it feels like the core of mm. the exhibition really is people and mm. the relationships between people. Definitely. Um, I guess I grew up with both a kind of strong sense of engagement with people and a creative practice that I was taught to separate. So uh, my mother actually, I mean, was constantly engaged in health education, music, um, food, you know, just all forms of um, community engagement since we were little. Um, we were tagged along to all of these different activities. And then my ph photographic and artistic practice developed simultaneously. Uh, but through education, I think I was taught to separate the two. You know, that kind of here's your practice and then here's the community. Um, but over the, the last decade or two, they've just become more and more interwoven. And there's a relationship that's really beneficial to both sides. So the more I release the kind of single authorship and open up the floor to questions or to discussions with others, the more I've found people are really excited and willing to share parts of their stories. Um, so the social practice is primarily among people, but it also includes um, more than human and non-human and dead things and um, ghosts, you know, Kimi's talking about ghosts here in this photograph or um, historical dinners that took place, um, rearranging them in non-hierarchical ways um, rather than according to royalty or according to, you know, like inherited um, power, uh, the table is oriented according to like where people are sitting today. So I guess the social practice is in some ways um, it's a very natural outgrowth of, of how I see co-created futures as something that benefits all people involved, but also a way of sort of sub subventing or maybe subverting um, power dynamics that have been set up or established through political as well as education. Um, I think we've been taught a lot of the lies and <laughs> rumors and things that have kind of come from, you know, we've been told one side of, of, of a really complicated, multi, multi spatial histories that, um, so through kind of re expanding the, the stories, I hope that even within each of us, you know, our own, you know, multicultural, multi place. Um, roots that this social practice is not just about me and you or other people, but it's also about the different yous that are inside yourself as well. So discovering your own roots together with other people um, who are also questioning their own backgrounds. Um, I think particularly now, even like during the current pandemic, it forced us to be very intimate and for all social engagement to be very conscious, to have clear kind of you know, number of people, the activity at hand, you know, we had to be very sort of think ahead of time about how it was all going to happen. But then once you've established that space, I think Kama space is a great space for that, but it's a place for allowing the interaction to happen um, in an open format where each person is valued member of that story. Um, so that's been, for this space, it's been really wonderful to experiment with that. Um, but that's something that, I mean, for not all of my works, but many of my works, the social engagement determines the format of the work rather than vice versa. Tell me a little bit about not just the figurative table that people are gathering around, but the mm. literal figure, or the literal mm. physical table that's mm. part of the show and how that's figured into your mm -hmm. sort of uh, engaging with other people mm. who are not already part of the project. Mm. So the table comes from a primary school here in Singapore and I chose to have it somewhat near the center but a little off center and we gather around in a circular format so it's a place for sharing stories, it's a place for re-educating or unlearning some of the histories that we've been taught. Um, so for example today there was one student who was really shocked to hear of a photograph of people 
in Johor connected to Molokai Island in Hawaii? Um, what are these completely disparate places doing with a string attached? Um, and so through talking stories together, we spoke about the friendship that formed um, between uh, Johor Sultan and King Kalakaua, just as one example in many other examples that are undocumented or that are still yet to be discovered of friendships and exchanges that have occurred between um, Southeast Asia and Polynesia is just one example. So while sitting around the table, um, you know, she learned about these interconnected histories and thought, wow, you know, today there could be a very different way of relating these two different places, um, which is not a part of anything that we've been taught. Um, so each time that we sit around the table, um, people introduce themselves uh, with their name and the direction they came from. So it's a way of reorienting our conversation. Um, maybe not just about our, our kind of identity that we've preconceived, but about a kind of physical identity of which direction we come from. Um, and so around the table, we've had many different conversations um, about string, I mean, so, Literally, the strings are on the table, so as you hold each one of these pieces, it connects to the walls and to everything in the room. So this idea that when you tug on one thread, you find a whole web of other things is, I think, important for everyone that sits at the table, is that you are you, but you're not alone. Um, people have been in isolation for a number of months nowadays, and just seeing other people, you know, is kind of a radical feeling sometimes. So just being around other people and realizing that you're not the only string um, has been a beautiful thing, I think, this month. Just for people to come in and see the connections that might be there, but not in the uh, front of their mind. And so we've also done some live streaming events where people can be seen um, the, the, the monitor is set up at the same height so that when you sit down, you're looking at people in the face. Um, so the space is actually really best experienced while you're sitting down. Um, the duration that people spend in here is much longer because of the social distancing regulations. By the time you check in and come into the space, you kind of end up staying. Um, so I think the quality of experiences is in some ways more like a classroom or a kind of uh, more like an experiment in what's possible rather than um, looking at something that an artist made in their studio. It's more about the connections that each person makes with their own life and their own future vision of, of how they might be able to re-navigate or re rediscover parts of, of themselves and the world. conversations mm. that can happen when people are sort of physically at ease and also mm. around, you know, a table, whether it's a kitchen table or, you know, something that feels like it's mm. a, you know, place for informal discussion and mm. gathering. Um, but I'm glad you brought up the monitor. So mm. in, in many ways, this feels like a very sort of trans-historical space mm. and, you know, very much sort of connected to elements of, you know, maybe an artisanal mm. <laughs> physical world. as well, but I kind of thought that it wouldn't make sense to have a video in the past tense, you know, the kind of idea of playing or replaying something. 
felt a bit disingenuous right now. There's a kind of, you know, things are happening in real time, in real space, even though they're online and we're mediated through screens. There's things that are going on and that are still affecting the room that we're in right now. Um, so the wind is one thing that's affecting, you know, us constantly. Um, the weather, the mood, the humidity, the pressure, the kind of patterns of, of our daily life, even though we think we have schedules, the wind actually does affect a lot of those um, schedules. So just putting something into the present tense and just um, letting it sort of be there um, was an intentional decision, I think, made during the, the pandemic. Um, taking a bit of my own editing hands or my own artistic hands off the, the sort of canvas, so to speak, and just allowing maybe the patterns, if there's a typhoon forming, it forms a different spiral. If it's sort of the lower level winds travel north generally in Singapore, whereas the higher winds go in a different direction, just noticing some of those um, larger movements. Um, while kind of sitting in this meditative space it sort of expands the analog or the kind of more historical kind of evidence to see how it's connected to what's happening right now. So when there are events, you know, for example, Saturdays, um, people's faces appear on the screen. Um, and when there's no events, it's just the wind kind of doing its meditative labor uh, passing around us. Um, so that was, it's small and intimate so that faces can be seen. Um, but it's just kind of, I, I, most everything in this space is, is kind of working with rather than for or by. Um, so it's less about doing something with a particular purpose, but it's more about how can we think with the wind, for example? How can we think with, you know, different communities or how can th we think with radical economic models like bonds in the Hawaiian government um, after it's decolonized from the U.S., you know, so kind of these are all different like ways of thinking with these, these um, kind of ideas in progress. So can you take us through one story or follow one string? where we go. So starting with one story, this story began with an article in the Straits Times in January 31st, 1881. It quoted about the King Kalakawa's journey around the world. Specifically, there was reference to him selling the kingdom to the German government, which continued to circulate, started in Singapore. This is an inverted map of Singapore, seen from the sea. So the story started in Singapore, which is now connected through containers and contemporary shipping to the rest of the world. However, while the king was on the voyage, establishing friendship, connections, sharing food, the story was eventually dispelled. Uh, this, there was no sale of a kingdom, and he was dancing and sharing gifts and enjoying songs and setting up consulates in a hundred or more nations around the world. Um, so the absurdity of the whole matter was pointed out months later. Um, this is one example of how a rumor that's quite damaging uh, circulated starting in Singapore. Um, but there's many other rumors or news things that have been printed about islanders or about people as they travel uh, that are quite damaging. So this exhibit is about how we can retell the stories of human connections, not through those damaging publications, but more through individual and community stories.
So the strings connected here retell both past and present stories in ways that empower communities with their own words and cherish connections um, that aren't about buying and selling, but are about sharing and exchanging things with each other. That's one example. Okay, yeah, sure. Chris yeah, yeah. He's here. Okay. So if we. Food, but, yeah. yeah, if we follow the blue, which has a natural connection between all the blues, back down from the sky, we come down to a menu, or should I say a reinterpretation of a menu of the food that was shared uh, between the Johor Sultan and the King of Hawaii. So food as a way of sharing and connecting, even while we're at home in our own living rooms or our own kitchen, is something that can dispel or can retell stories of connection between places. Um, so it's something that every day we need to eat in order to subsist and to take care of each other. And so sharing those recipes and those foods um, is a way of, of really enjoying life, indulging, and sharing our culture as well. Um, so this is a, a reinterpretation of some of the foods that were eaten. And again, kind of user-friendly. So the idea is that some of these could be used for actual meals um, as menus. And it continues here towards the exit. Port Klang to New York in 29 days is a cover or the back cover of a shipping catalog. And so this slows it as we depart. It's kind of a direct sailings every week. So once a week you can depart for New York, but you have to have 29 days ready to go. Um, so the idea is, I mean, this is for luggage or for containers, but as humans, slowing down to a kind of transit between one place and another um, is right, kind of... there's no jet lag. <laughs> yeah. if you're going slow enough to take a month. Just the, the sea legs. <laughs> um, so this is the last before exiting the space. It's interesting that that's the last because I saw that first. Or first. <laughs> but also for you... you know, that's where I grew up. Yeah, where we grew up. And I thought that was a really interesting way to mm. sort of enter the space in this mm. sort of vocabulary of mm. the sort of current economic mm. uh, modality of transporting goods, but mm. also seeing that there's this actually yeah. kind of like nostalgic picture mm. for, you know, a very busy Fifth Avenue. Or yeah, yeah, it's like a <laughs> stereotypical uptown kind of New York street. Right, it's <laughs> yeah. not like the port of Newark. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, the, where the ships would yeah. actually go. But it's kind of yeah. like this place that has a very, you know, sort of special mm. place in the hearts of people who are from there or who mm. are not that have this sort of romantic right. association with it. Mm. And I guess maybe that's actually another question that I had, mm. but there is this kind of romance, I feel, mm. that's part of all of these stories, mm. right? So it's like you do have this you know, economic relationship between, you mm. know, people, between countries, between modes of consumption, but then there's also, mm. you know, a sort of poetry and nostalgia to mm. these places, to these times, to a different way mm. of being, like, you know, the idea that, mm. you know, the sovereign kingdoms, mm. you know, had particular cultural, you know, centers of gravity mm. that are not present now that we probably think might be improvements upon mm. the, the present. Mm. So, I mean, how does nostalgia work for mm. you? True. Well, because so much of it is about uncovering the truth, but then nostalgia yeah. also has this sort of yeah. happy untruth. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, the past is not all pretty, you know. There's lots of tension and conflict and yeah. things that come from the past. I guess it's kind of um, about remembrance more than nostalgia mm -hmm. and nost yeah I guess it's kind of it's definitely selective remembrance everything's selective and how we talk about the past it's never kind of a hundred you know 
inheriting the truth from the past and kind of just presenting it for the future. It's about selecting and choosing different parts of the past that are relevant to what's happening now. So I guess it's um, what I hope to be doing is to select different stories or different connections between the past and the present that are meaningful to today in order to help form a future which is built on those connections. So it's, yeah, I guess there's no perfect you know, ancestor or no perfect story from different, you know, histories of the past, but there are models for how we can think more today together with, uh, let's say, natural elements or cultural practices that have become almost obsolete. Some of those practices are still really relevant and people are hungry for more ways of of connecting to the land, for example. I think in Singapore, I hear all the time young people that feel disconnected from the sea or disconnected from the dirt or, you know, really kind of questioning why am I doing what I'm doing? You know, really intense, like wanting to understand who am I and what am I connected to? Um, So returning to certain moments in the past, remembering those histories, sometimes of your own, relatives, sometimes of other people's relatives, can really help to make decisions about your own life and the future that are more connected to those, you know, kind of interconnected histories. Um, So yeah, there's, it, it sort of comes in waves, and when a big wave comes, there's both suffering and, you know, truth and lies, and, you know, it comes all mixed together. It doesn't come one or the other. Um, And so it's definitely selective and there's a kind of criteria that goes into it. Um, It's kind of a way of selecting the things that are, it's the right time to be told. There's many things that aren't, it's not okay to be told right now. So checking in with cultural practitioners and, you know, local leaders, you know, before any of these drawings are shown, I check in with the people who did the drawings or the communities, you know, with, with Kayla Balami about is this okay to show in this format, in this size, in this way? And if they say no for any reason, then it's not the right time to show that. Or if they say, I'd like to see it in this color or this shape or this size, that's important to just acknowledge. So that's, I guess, the criteria. It's, not, it's me and each of the participants acknowledging, okay, you know, if anyone whose face is in here, they've seen the photograph and they've said, yes, I want to be seen in this way. Um, So that's important that it's a decision made both by them and by me um, about what to show and how to show it. I was hoping we could have a moment to talk Mm. story a bit about where Mm. you're from and particularly where you're from. No, no, that sounds good. Sure. Um, I guess the one thing that I'm connected in all the places I've lived is the sea. Um, So I was raised in Manhattan on the east side by the East River, which flows into the sea. Um, We would watch, before going to school, sit on the back of the sofa and watch tugboats come and go along the river. Um, Left a strong impression on me. Just this morning I was watching um, ships come and go, tugboats pick up their loads and drop them off and it's sort of a very subconsciously soothing thing just to see uh, boats come and go. So as a child um, I grew up in New York but we moved to Boston um, when I was young and then I lived in the west coast of the U.S. for a number of years and then in Hawaii um, and Japan Fukuoka, and then now in Singapore. Um, So each of those places are, most of them are islands. And I didn't know why I lived in those places or gravitated to those places until recently. Uh, My grandfather passed away at age 93, and he gave me a a copy of a journal written by an ancestor of mine named James Jack, um, which was kept in 1843 when he left Scotland. So this is just one side of my family because obviously there's the matrilineal female side of all my previous ancestors whose names don't Mm -hmm. continue to me, unfortunately. Uh, But Jack comes from the the 
male side of my family and so his name was James Jack and it talks about so he went through from the highlands of Scotland to Liverpool and then took a boat to the US and kept records the whole way um, so reading that made me realize that I really wanted to know why he left where he left from what all of the things that weren't in the journal and why they weren't written down um, so that's led me to read a lot more um, poetry of people from the Scottish Renaissance in the 1920s, um, politicians and even the Communist Party, which existed in pre-war Scotland and the independence movement that's happening now, um, Gaelic language that's been dying and really getting very, very few speakers today. Um, and that made me realize that the kind of underlying theme of my whole life's work is to kind of retain Islanders' stories and to preserve language and culture of people that have left the place where they um, were born. Language, culture, traditions of the Highlands became a way for me to reimagine connection to a place that uh, my ancestors have been disconnected from and learning more about for example in 1515 when the you know British started to overtake politically and economically a lot of the islanders and disempower and make their language illegal and change a lot of the the narrative of that region it has a strong resonance with a lot of the other islands that I've lived on and the dispossession and you know kind of the material consequences of stories and how um, telling or retelling histories from the victor's point of view is really causes all kinds of problems and um, really difficult situations that we now need to kind of untangle and um, understand through storytelling. Um, so that's that's a little bit about me. But please tell. Let's hear your hear your story. No. Before you came to Singapore, so, mm. so you came to Singapore twice, right? Yeah. So you first came for your residency at mm. CCA and then came back just mm -hmm. a few years? Yeah, Singapore. Um, and so, you know, previously I think you had been sort of from Japan for yeah. the majority of your career, your yeah. adult life. And so maybe talk a little bit about mm. that aspect of, you know, where you came from when mm. you first got to Singapore and then sort of the decision to return mm. and yeah. Singapore's imprinted itself. Yeah, um, Singapore. In your yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I was based in Japan, mostly in Tokyo for ten years, and Fukuoka for two years. Um, first lived in Kyoto in the 1990s, but moved back to the U.S. Um, so yeah, the first few times I came to Singapore was always coming from Japan. Um, first for an exhibition at La Salle ICA, and then the longer, you know, longer stay where I really was in residence was thanks to CCA. And that made a... The CCA was a big turning point because that was the point where I didn't have a particular deadline or a particular itinerary, but I was just here. Um, and that's when I really started to listen to more Islanders' histories and visit the harbor and to see the sort of militarized, reclaimed, fenced kind of realities of what's in the Singapore Harbor, and that really intrigued me. Um, the kind of, you know, complicated contemporary and historical relationships in Singapore um, left a strong impression, and so I returned back to Japan, and um, three, four years later, um, ended up coming here to work, um, really, to investigate more of those, the artworks that I had started, the workshops, the writings, creative, um, you know, kind of intercultural exchanges um, were really kind of, it's hard to describe, but they were hard to, to verbalize in a real concise way, but they were things that I felt were very relevant and yeah, imagination, the importance of imagination felt very important to me because of its lack or because of its kind of the way it was being sidelined. So that brought me back to Singapore beginning of 2018 and I've been based here 
ever since, but returning to Japan and to other um, communities that I worked with in the past. So now, yeah, for a while it was quite strange. I always felt like we were going back to Japan. Um, this year has solidified the Singapore thing. <laughs> Not, not by choice, but also it's, it's okay, we're okay with it, but we're definitely based in Singapore now. Um, there's no kind of pretending you're based in, an, in another country after the pandemic. <laughs> so please tell me more of your story. I mean, I think it's interesting that we're both from New York, mm -hmm. where you have to identify as like the quadrant of New York. <laughs> that you're from like, yeah, yeah. in any number of social yeah. interactions throughout the day. Mm. Um, so I was born on the Upper West Side. Mm. Um, but actually spending time with you in your work and in this space has also mm. made me remember something that I always kind of liked mm. about being from New York mm. and you know the sort of false nostalgia mm. of being, you know, from most people identify with a version of New York or wherever they're from, mm -hmm. actually maybe a generation or two mm -hmm. <laughs> previous, yeah. right? So it's like I grew up with like a certain reality and mm -hmm. spent a lot of time, you know, in you know a particular neighborhood that had also been a neighborhood that like my parents had spent time in, mm -hmm. you know, in the '60s. But it was a completely different place. Like it was mm -hmm. a time and place when like poor students could get an apartment for like a hundred dollars mm. and kind of make it work. Mm. Um, so, you know, this idea of, you know, kind of what's real and what's imagined, mm. but in some cases the imaginary is actually more important and more meaningful. Mm. Um, so similarly for me, um, you know, getting this question of where you're from mm. my whole life, uh, it's always been kind of mm. an imaginary that I want to share with people, which I like. So, because, you know, my family is Chinese from Indonesia, um, but, you know, we're extremely well, like, documented and historicized. So, my family was in Indonesia for, for like, eight generations, uh, which is longer than most people can sort of trace yeah, yeah. their family lineage. Um, and, of course, you know, prior to that, we're from Fujian in China. It's funny that, you know, hundreds of years later, the primary cultural identification is still Chinese. Eight generations yeah. later. <laughs> Even though, um, you know, my father, you know, his generation in like, you know, born in the 1940s like, or 50s, mm -hmm. still grew up speaking Dutch as their first language. And so I think when people ask me where I'm from, I have to explain this sort of complicated colonial mm -hmm. history of how ethnically Chinese most of the time, depends who you are, so where we are, um, from Indonesia, grew up speaking Dutch, and then now very dispersed based on immigration patterns from like the 1960s and 70s, so I have family, or, you know, basically cousins in Canada, in Holland, and kind of Benelux countries. <laughs> Um, and in Indonesia, and you know, for me, that's kind of interesting that I've always had this sort of network mm -hmm. that, you know, in some ways is real, in some ways is the imaginary sort of world that, say, my father or my grandparents or their grandparents inhabited. Um, but then there's also this very, very real cultural connection to all of these generations back, and that is the mm -hmm. food. Yeah. And so I think for me picking up on that as this sort of way of sort of very literally connecting, you know, not just with, you know, the past, but with other people and with people that you might have things in common with that you mm. wouldn't otherwise necessarily know that, that resonates quite profoundly. And um, mm. to be honest, that is part of why I moved here with, you know, now my family, my husband and son. To Singapore because there is, you know, a linguistic connection in terms of Bahasa mm. and Mandarin, kind of to these other sort of cultural roots of mine. But then it's also a place where we can very easily get Indonesian or you know, Malaysian food <laughs> that speaks to this other side 
you know, what I consider lineage and culture and heritage. So it's interesting that, you know, the directions become very spread out, right? It's like I, I primarily identify having, you know, Indonesian food when I was young with being in Holland. And so it's like the, the strings go in different directions, they intersect mm. in different ways. Um, mm. But it is this actual net, it is this interconnected net. Mm. Like you say, if you sort of tug in one direction, it's not just one string, it's sort of an entire um, Wow. What does it feel like now that you're based here in Singapore? I guess it just makes me question everything all over again because it's like there are the inherited assumptions that I have, not just about Singapore, but about the region, you know, and how things are sort of linguistically mixed or culturally mixed. Mm. Uh, cuisine that is a very sort of mixed experience, but then there's also kind of the, again, the, the lived experience of 2020 is, you know, this sort of reinterpretation of heritage, but also a sort of, you know, interest in adapting, modernizing, moving, you know, all of those things, whether it's language or culture, um, in different directions. So, mm. in many ways I feel like I'm very, very well connected, and in many ways I feel like I'm completely unmoored, and I think that that's actually a sign that, um, that I live in reality, which is that we're all sort of unmoored. <laughs> but then we're all also very connected to, you know, whether it's to the history of our own culture or of a place that, you know, culture is actually kind of a universal thing to be explored and to be uh, mined. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I wonder, what does Indonesian food in Holland feel like compared to Indonesian food in Singapore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to either prepare it in a particular way or know how to order it in a particular way. Mm. It's authentic, again, in a way where in some cases the diaspora population mm. actually preserves... Even you know, more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And I'm also told that linguistically that I speak, you know, Indonesian. And earlier. Like an old grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> Which is where you learned it, right? Yeah. From the earlier generation. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Well, no, that's, I think skipping a generation or two is also something that might even be more rooted or more grounding than we think it is. Like passing down from parent to child, parent to child is a sort of standard way of thinking about culture or food or language. But skipping two generations and then coming back or skipping one generation and coming back might be a more sort of mythologically sound way of thinking mm -hmm. you know the way we react to our parents for example and do something very different and then it recirculates with a grandchild or with the next generation there's a poem by Hugh McDermott that I read during the CB uh, called Island Funeral and he wrote it in the 1930s um, it's about an island in Shetland where people are, it's becoming less and less populated and they're digging the grave, but it ends, it's quite sad, but the end, it's, there's a musical instrument that starts midway through and that instrument comes in the very end and it says, the tone of that instrument might be forgotten for a generation or two, but it will always be remembered by a third generation or by people who listen for it. So even though they're burying these, you know, people and the way of life on the island, the crafts, the wood the furniture, the songs, the language are being kind of rapidly, you know, forgotten by the younger generation. This musical instrument brings it back to the third generation or the second generation that want to hear that music. And that's just such a beautiful, like, way of thinking, I thought. You know, for me, it reawoken a lot of the memories of previous generations that might have intentionally forgotten what they're doing. He also happened to die the, within a month of when I was born. <laughs> so, things started to get kind of like a bit, what do you call that, I don't know, 
the spirits are kind of <laughs> re-channeling their energies. Like whenever one person dies, it, they say it re-enters another person or things like that, right? So anyway, there's a different way of looking at time and space through spirits. That sounds like with your own family histories, there are certain elements that have gone through and sort of woven on the front, and then there's these other elements that are kind of woven on the backside, which you can continue to explore here in Southeast Asia. Let me show you something. Tell me what we're looking at. This is a navigation chart based on previous models. It's a way of re-navigating into the future that we wish to see. So this exhibition gives us ways of orienting ourselves using the sky and different knowledges from the past so that we can find ways to move towards a future that we want to see together.